Hello, my name is David Andalfato. I'm with the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis and I'm here at the 40th Annual Fall Policy Conference. And we're here uh, joined by Emmanuel Farhi from Harvard University. Uh, Emmanuel's uh, going to present a paper uh, co-authored with Ricardo Caballero with a rather uh, uh, cryptic uh, but intriguing title called The Safety Trap. Thank you for, very much for being here, Emmanuel. Thank you for I, inviting me. I was wondering, uh, well, why don't you go ahead and, and, and tell us, what is a safety trap and uh, wh wh uh, why is this interesting? So uh, we chose that title, The Safety Trap, uh, because it's related to a liquidity trap. But uh, it, uh, a liquidity trap is a situation where uh, there's a lot of demand for uh, assets and there's a, a shortage of assets in general. And then so much so that the price of assets goes up, which means that the interest rate goes down. But the interest rate can't go below zero because uh, there's money and uh, bonds would be uh, dominated by money if the interest rate were to go negative. So let me just back up a second. You say there's a shortage of assets, but a particular type of assets, right? Not, not like a shortage of General Motors shares? That's, That's right. I mean, what so are you talking a liquidity about? trap doesn't make a distinction between different forms of assets. Okay. And they all have the same uh, expected return. And what we try to, the perspective that we try to bring in is that uh, the situation that I think we're in now is a situation of a shortage of a very specific kind of assets, okay. safe assets, and not a shortage of assets in general. Okay, so uh, it's, it's a different form of asset shortage uh, of a specific kind, safe assets, that brings you to a similar situation, the zero lower bound. And uh, what we try to explain uh, in the paper is that the consequences of the fact that it's a very specific form of asset shortage and then an asset shortage in general that brings you there makes a very important difference for the way you want to think about the situation and the way you want to think about policy in particular in this situation. Let, okay, let's, let's move back a bit. So what type of uh, assets do you have in mind that are in such short supply? So I have in mind safe assets, broadly speaking, and by that I mean essentially treasuries, uh, or you could think about government bonds, government bonds, safe government bonds, safe government bonds, or you could think about uh, very uh, highly rated tranches of securitization products, okay. triple A rated, triple securities. A rated securities, okay. and things of that sort that would be backed uh, by some form of real assets. Okay. It could be uh, eventually backed by land, so or some form of real estate, or it could be backed uh, by. Uh, by corporate assets. Right. So what does it mean to have a shortage of these assets? I mean, I, I, we could say, for example, there's a shortage of highly skilled labor. Right. And what we would expect is the, the price of highly skilled labor to uh, reflect that shortage. And, and is that not the same case with a shortage of safe assets? So it's exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And actually, there's a way to view a shortage of, of safe assets as a benign phenomenon. You know, if there is not enough uh, safe assets, the price of safe assets is going to go up. Okay. And if the shortage intensifies, the price will go up even further. What the problem is that when you're at the zero lower bound, the price that is supposed to make to do this adjustment, the interest rate, cannot do the job. Right. And so instead of having uh, uh, this, uh, this virtuous equilibrating mechanism through a, a decrease in interest rates, you're going to have a perverse equilibrating mechanism that's going to come into play uh, through a reduction in output and a recession, which is going to bring back uh, the safe asset market in equilibrium. Okay, so let me see if I get this right. So normally you say, in most cases, we would expect this asset shortage to be reflected, say, in the price of bonds or the bond yield. Right. Uh, the scarcity should be reflected in a higher price for the security, a lower yield. But at that some point, the yield is bounded by li below by zero or That's some right. lower bound because let's just say it's there for the moment. Um, and because the price mechanism is no longer able to equilibrate the market, the equilibration has to take place through another dimension. Exactly. Through a, a so that's exactly right. The, 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 price the, the, the market cannot equilibrate through prices, and instead it will equilibrate through quantities. But what are these safe assets doing that uh, their shortage causes this, uh, the, the uh, output to fall below right. normal levels? What? So what, what, what we have in mind is that people demand these assets mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. And we actually don't uh, go too much in detail into these reasons. And we assume that there are some people who are extremely risk averse mm 
And so for uh, either preferences reasons or institutional mandates reasons or regulations reason, they have a demand for these safe assets. And even though these safe assets are not doing anything special, they just preserve value and that's, this is what these agents care about, either because of their preferences or because uh, they're obligated to do that, that, that drives up the demand for these safe assets. And the fact that there is a, a lot of demand chasing uh, a little pot of safe assets, that's what creates the problem. But how, how does, uh, suppose uh, I'm a risk-averse agent and I, I want to hold a lot of bonds uh, and uh, I'm out there bidding for these bonds, I guess what, what, what is the idea that uh, I should be out buying shoes and restaurant meals but instead I'm chasing government bonds and is that yeah. what, what is happening? So it's a market failure, uh -huh. which means that agents are doing the best they can yeah. uh, from a pride perspective. Uh, it just ends up creating a problem at the level of the economy yeah, in general. Sure, but uh, point me point me to some evidence of, of people uh, behaving in a and privately they're doing the best they can. But right. what should they be doing if they're not buying these safe assets? They, uh, in, they are. They are. in equilibrium. They are trying to buy them, and okay. they're succeeding in buying them. They're guess, satisfying their demand. What I'm asking is, how does this manifest itself as a reduction in output? Right. So the reduction in output takes place because you have normal rigidities. Okay, and that means that output is going to be demand determined. Okay. And it's a, it's a recession that's going to end up lowering the demand for safe assets. And that's an equilibrium phenomenon. So that uh, firms would, would, would like to produce more output, but they cannot because the interest rate is... No, they would not like to produce more. Okay. They would like there to be more demand for their output. I see, this is what but I But there is none, and yeah. they cannot lower their prices yeah. to attract more demand because there are normal rigidities. Or oh. maybe wages are rigid. That would have a very similar implication. Oh, okay, so, there, so uh, nominal uh, price rigidities are a, a property. Of, it's very important oh, okay. for this phenomenon okay. to get going. So, um, this zero lower bound problem, there have been a, no a number of economists who have advocated uh, that the Fed or, or other banks in other jurisdictions have done this, in fact, is to lower the nominal interest rate uh, right. into negative territory. Would those types of policies alleviate this problem? To the extent that it's possible, and I think that it's pos probably possible to lower interest rates a bit below zero, uh -huh. it would help. Okay. I do think that there's a limit. Uh, to these policies. All right. So, wh why don't you tell us specifically then the, the the set of, you know, the question, the key question, or the set of questions you're addressing in this paper, and, and kind of how you're building your your theoretical setup to address this question. Right. So, just to recap, mm -hmm. the model is uh, a model that makes the point and builds a structure that delivers that a safe asset shortage can drive the interest rate all the way to zero but it will not drive uh, the uh, expected return on every asset to zero. So you have, it's a model where you have risk premium, okay? And that conforms with some of the recent evidence. So you've seen uh, everybody has uh, commented on the fact that there's been a uh, secular decline uh, in short and long interest rates. Mm -hmm. At the onset of the recession, interest rates quickly reached zero. But the equity premium, uh, there is evidence that it has actually increased. Can you explain the, uh, the risk premium and the equity premium very quickly for right. our listeners? Here? So the, the idea is that uh, risky assets mm -hmm. uh, 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 compensate uh, their holders for the risk that they're bearing by paying a higher return. Sure. For, uh, if you look in the market, equities have a higher return than bonds. And the question is, how big is the gap? And uh, the fact that seems to be emerging is that this gap has widened. So even though interest rates have been going down, and especially since the beginning of the recession, that it's a trend that predates the recession, the rate of return on risky assets like equities has not gone down. So mm -hmm. you've seen a divergence between these two things, which in my mind is the signature of the fact that the shortage of assets that we're seeing is not a shortage of assets in general, but a shortage of safe assets. Uh -huh. Risky assets are not particularly cheap. Safe assets uh, are exp expensive. Safe assets uh, are very expensive. Now, we build this structure and we explain how this situation can lead to a recession. Okay. So it's something that could uh, rationalize part of what's going on uh, or ha what has been going on uh, in the U.S. Say, uh, during the Great Recession. And then we try to uh, understand what policy could do.
So we really, already talked about one kind of policies, which would be uh, trying to lower the normal interest rate below zero. And I think we could probably do some of that, but that we would reach some limits at some point because people would start substituting into cash. Okay. Uh, now, we look at other policies that have actually been deployed uh, during the Great Recession, and we try to assess their performance in the model and compare their performance in the model to uh, their perceived performance uh, in the data. So the kind of policies that we look at are uh, unconventional monetary policies. So one thing that works really well in this model is to increase the inflation target because that allows you to uh, run a, a negative real interest rates even though normal interest rates are at zero because you have inflation. So that would be a good idea in the model. If you can do that, uh, there are other things you can try to do. Another dimension of unconventional monetary policy is what people call forward guidance. And forward guidance means uh, you can't do anything with, money, with interest rates, uh, with current interest rates anymore because those are already at zero, but you can try to promise to keep interest rates low in the future when the economy recovers. And that's a, a policy that uh, in typical models of liquidity traps works really, really well. It stimulates uh, output and is very effective. And empirically, people have observed that uh, the potency of this kind of policy might be much more limited. And, and people are starting to term this phenomenon the forward guidance puzzle. And this is something that we can rationalize in our model. So in our model, uh, if our explanation is correct, uh, forward guidance is, is very ineffective, okay, in contrast to standard liquidity traps analysis. So if you're in a safety trap where uh, what drives the economy to the zero lower bound is a shortage of safe assets, forward guidance doesn't work very well. And this is in sharp contrast to what happens in a liquidity trap where uh, the economy reaches the zero lower bound because you have a shortage of assets in general and where forward guidance works really well. Another kind of policy that we consider is uh, quantitative easing. So there have been several rounds of quantitative easing that have been implemented in the U.S. and we have some evidence as to, uh, as to their effects, even though uh, it's, uh, it's very debated. So we have had different programs, QE1, QE2, QE3, and uh, we try to understand how that would work uh, in our environment. And uh, it turns out that one thing that works really well in a safety trap is uh, for the government to purchase risky assets and to issue safe assets. So a, a version of QE like QE1 is something that would be very effective. So the government would either issue reserves or uh, issue uh, some other forms of safe short-term liabilities and acquire private risky assets. And by doing so, the government increases the supply of safe assets and stimulates the economy. And uh, so, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a theory of uh, quantitative easing that could rationalize why uh, these kind of policies could be effective. So I have several questions that pop into my head. Uh, let's, let's go back to the beginning, first of all, in terms of what in your mind would be the driving force that would uh, lead to a, such a shortage, uh, and specifically what, what sort of shocks might have led the economy to fall into the recession? that we've recently seen, uh, or uh, as you mentioned, uh, there seems to be some sort of secular phenomenon at work here too. What, what was the driving force behind the shortage of uh, safe assets? Right. So for the secular decline, people have mentioned uh, different kinds of hypotheses. Uh, and they go from the global savings glut, the accumulation of reserves by emerging market, precautionary savings in the emerging market, some people have mentioned demographics. Uh, some people have mentioned the decline of the relative price of investment goods and, and things of that sort. What I want to point out is that a lot of these explanations uh, rationalize the decline in interest rates, but not necessarily uh, the increase in the risk, the risk premium. And so uh, that's a, a phenomenon that has to be driven, I think, by other things. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's an important driver of the decline in interest rate, that, uh, one that, that, shouldn't be, uh, that shouldn't be neglected. Um, now, I think there are two things mechanically that can uh, drive uh, up this uh, shortage of safe assets. It's demand or, or supply, uh, to, put it, uh, to put it very simply. And I think there's an element of both. Uh, especially if you think about uh, what triggered uh, the recent crisis and the recent uh, sharp decline in safe interest rates 
uh, at the onset of the crisis. I think there are some supply factors. Uh, so uh, I think it's, it's, it's reasonable to, to, to have the following view that there are a lot of assets that people thought were safe. Mm. And they suddenly realized they were not so safe anymore. And for example, uh, you can think about uh, some kind of assets backed by residential and some tranches of securitization products that were sold and marketed as being very safe and people per perhaps perceived that they were really safe and in fact it turned out that they were more, much more risky than people imagined. So that could lead to a contraction in the supply of safe assets. Another kind of assets that uh, people thought were safe and turned out not to be so safe anymore is uh, if you look at sovereign debt of periphery country uh, in Europe. Uh, so this, these uh, assets had very, very low yields, uh, of very low spreads compared to very safe countries uh, before the crisis, and these yields and these spreads have uh, exploded uh, at some point during the crisis. So you have a contraction in the supply, and I think it's uh, very natural to imagine that there's also an increase in the demand for safe assets at the onset of a recession like this one. People are just uh, scared and That's afraid true. for a variety of reasons and uh, financial intermediaries are also hitting all kind of regulatory constraints and that's going to drive up safe asset demand. I'll come back uh, uh, subsequently to a discussion about what uh, policy can do perhaps about augmenting the supply of safe assets or regulations that might regulate private sector manufacture but for now I want to touch uh, back on the, the very interesting subtle point you made I, I've actually never heard of this before this apparent distinction between a liquidity trap and a safety trap. Uh, and the suggestion that the standard forward guidance kind of principle of Woodford et al. Uh, works uh, uh, very well in a liquidity trap situation, but not so much in a safety trap situation. Can you, in simple terms, uh, what, what is the distinguishing characteristic between a standard type of liquidity trap and uh, what you, you're labeling here a safety trap? Right. So I'm going to answer your question by uh, first saying again that what distinguishes a safety trap and a liquidity trap is uh, whether it's about a shortage of safe assets in specifically uh -huh. or assets in general. Now, how is that relevant for uh, how forward guidance plays out and the effectiveness of forward guidance? So forward guidance, you can think of it in a very schematic form as follows in a typical liquidity trap. You would try to, you're going to promise low interest rates in the future. What that's going to do is it's going to stimulate consumption and demand today through a variety of channels. One of them is that uh, it will increase the value of assets in the future because interest rates will be lower. And because uh, if you expect the value of assets to go up in the future, it will, the value of assets will go up today. And so it will boost the value of assets today. So forward guidance would boost the value of assets today and it will stimulate spending and demand through a wealth effect. People are richer, they spend more, it stimulates the economy. In a safety trap, this logic doesn't go through. Why? Because, think about it, what you're trying to do is to increase the value of assets after the economy has recovered. So you're in trying to increase the value of assets after good states of the world. And you will achieve that. So the value of assets after the economy recovers will be high. The question is whether it's going to increase the value of assets today. And what happens in a safety trap is that that effect is largely dissipated through an increase in risk premium today when you're in the safety trap. So the value of risky assets actually doesn't go up all that much. As a result, wealth doesn't go up all that much. And spending is not stimulated all that much. And so forward guidance loses some of its bite. And you can think about it maybe uh, in the following way. Uh, forward guidance is a failed attempt at revaluing uh, risky assets and it's largely dissipated in higher risk premium. So it doesn't boost the value of risky assets all that much. And it's because it's trying to increase the supply of risky assets and that's not the problem in the safety trap. I see. The problem is the supply of safe assets. I see. So this is where you're, the, the recommendation of kind of these direct inter interventions, the direct purchases That's right. of these risky assets, either through uh, Federal Reserve balances or I suppose even the U.S. Treasury might issue safe bonds. Do you, uh, either way, uh, essentially a swap of uh, uh, public debt, uh, private risky debt for safe public debt. These are the policies that seem to work. 
Right. So uh -huh. you could think about, uh, on this dimension, increasing the supply of safe assets, about two kinds of policies along the lines that you suggested. The first one would be just to uh, increase the level of public debt. Okay? And we have all sorts of reasons to be worried about increases in public debt and to worry about fiscal sustainability and all of these things. And I don't want to minimize them. Mm -hmm. I want to point out that increasing the supply of public debt in a situation like this would, could also have beneficial effect mm -hmm. because it would increase the supply of safe assets sure. to the extent that, isn't, that it doesn't crowd out private safe assets. And so we have a way in the model of, of trying to think about how much crowd out there's going to be in different regimes. And issuing debt or swapping debt for private risky assets will be more effective if there's less crowd out. And it's something that you can try to measure empirically Sure. how much crowd out there is. So, and in terms of the other policy you mentioned, uh, raising the inflation target, right. would that be, in your view, or in the, uh, through the lens of your model, uh, relatively uh, less, less effective, less desirable, or equivalent? So, in the model, that works really well. It does. And uh, it's a model that's not necessarily very good at thinking about all the costs yeah. of inflation, which... I also think that collectively, uh, as economists, we don't understand so well. Uh, so uh, I don't want to comment too much on what would be the costs okay. of increasing the inflation target, but I do want to point out that there is a benefit in this model, which is that it would stimulate the economy. I, I, I'm a little surprised by that. Let me just say why, because I, I think I read, uh, raise the interest rate, if, uh, the inflation rate, if we could just raise the uh, inflation rate, we'll have the effect of lowering the real rate of interest and we'll have a negative real rate of return and the economy is going to be really good. Uh, and I, I had trouble, uh, you know, I don't normally associate negative real rates of interest to kind of good, well-functioning, growing economies. I mean, is there, am I thinking about this the wrong way or could you elaborate on that? So I think there are two things. Mm -hmm. The first thing is, uh, suppose there are a variety of shocks driving the economy. So the interest rate is naturally going to go up and down. Okay? And we would expect some correlation between interest rates and economic sure. activity just from the shocks that are hitting the economy, mm -hmm. not thinking about policy. Then there's another question, which is, what is the effect of monetary policy? And do you believe that lowering the normal interest rate is something that would stimulate the economy or contract the economy? Okay? And the way... Uh, some people think that monetary policy operates when you lower the normal interest rate, you end up lowering the real interest rate, and that stimulates the economy. And that's exactly what would happen if you had a higher inflation target in a safety trap. You lower the real interest rate, mm. and uh, you stimulate the economy. All right. Um, what about in terms of then uh, the, uh, you mentioned, you know, uh, Prior to the lead up to the crisis, we had several uh, private label products, AAA rated tranches of mortgage backed securities kind of serving as collateral in repo markets. And, and like you mentioned, people were perceiving these objects to be relatively safe. Uh, and, and, and suddenly this perception seemed to have evaporated. Um, in your model, I think you also deal with the issue of the uh, private provision of these assets, what motivates people to create these assets, what limits their ability to do so, and whether there's any reason to believe that the, whether the private sector could be left to its own devices to produce these products. Can you tell us a little bit about the endogenous supply of these assets and what right. role there might be for government regulation of these yeah, products? Okay. So that's, that's a very uh, good and uh, important question. And um, so in, in the paper, we try to ask precisely this question, whether uh, private agents would have the right incentives to create these safe assets. Okay? So whether, uh, in our words, uh, the private incentives to securitize will be uh, aligned with social incentives to securitize. And what we find is the following, that in normal times, when you're away from the zero lower bound, you're not in a safety trap, private and social incentives are aligned. And there's no particular reason for the government to uh, intervene in the securitization market. There's no market failure. But when you're at the zero lower bound, when you're in a safety trap, there is a market failure. And the private incentives are not aligned with social incentives in a very particular direction, uh, which is the following. Agents are going to do too little securitization compared to what's socially optimal because they're not internalizing the, the macro-stabilization benefits of issuing more safe assets. 
which is uh, it's an aggregate demand uh, externally that they're not internalizing. And so there's a role for the government to correct for this externality by encouraging the private supply of, uh, of safe assets. And there's a way in which it relates to very concrete policies that governments implement in financial crisis, like helping financial institutions to make sure that the securitization process uh, can work uh, effectively. And this was the motivation, uh, it, it was a motivation that was given for a lot of these programs to restart the securitization market that was perceived to be very important. Okay, very interesting. So, uh is there any reason to believe that the uh, incentives that the government has to produce these uh, safe assets is necessarily aligned with uh, public interests? <laughs> That's too big of a question <laughs> for a 15 minute interview. So what this paper does is outline kind of uh, guiding principles for a well-designed public policy right. with kind of downplaying kind of certain types of uh, um, incentives that uh, different government agencies might have, I guess. Not downplaying them. But right explaining what could be the benefits of sure. certain government policies. Yeah, so very interesting uh, uh, paper, I think. And uh, so perhaps would you like to uh, just, can you summarize in, in, in two or three takeaway points the main lessons of the paper here as far as your concern for our, our audience? Right. So I think a very important fact is uh, that we have been, if you look at a, a lot of big financial crises, they've been associated with, with the, a zero lower bound episode. And particularly if you look at the Great Recession, it's been associated with the zero lower bound. Now, risk premium and, uh, and the returns of risky assets are not at zero. They're not at the zero lower bound. Actually, they're relatively mm -hmm. high. Okay? So that's an indication that uh, we are more in a safety trap than in a standard liquidity trap. And taking that perspective has very important implications for the way you think about how you're going to deal with that situation from a policy perspective. And just to recap very briefly, increasing the inflation target is something that would work well. Doing forward guidance is something that would not work so well. And quantitative easing is something that would work relatively well. Quantitative easing, though, in a specific form. So I think you, if I gather what you're saying, you might be a critic of the Fed's recent quantitative easing where we're purchasing relatively safe right. securities in, in our open market operations. Precisely. Here. So we try to make a distinction between mm -hmm. the different QE programs that right. have been implemented and, and whether you th the Fed is, it matters a lot what kind of risky assets the right. Fed is purchasing. Because the modern finance perspective on risk is that risk is not variance, it's covariance. Mm -hmm. So what you want to know in, in uh, finance lingo is what's the beta of the asset that the Fed is purchasing. And if they're purchasing private risky assets that have a positive beta, then they're increasing the net supply of safe assets. Right. But they, if they purchase long-term government bonds, and if those long-term government bonds happen to have a negative beta, as there is some evidence that uh, they have that feature, then these QE programs could even backfire. Backfire, that's right. Uh, I, I can't help but I have to ask another question, and, and that is, uh, if, if you had to make a recommendation to the Treasury or the Fed as to what the appropriate basket of risky assets would be to purchase, what would you recommend? I think you have to be uh, very careful there because you have to uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. make sure you, you know, the, the independence of the Fed is a fragile construct that, uh, that we need to, to, to be very aware of. Uh, but I think it's a question that people are asking actually in Europe right now. Yeah. What kind of assets uh, should they be purchasing? What kind of risky assets should they be purchasing? And they're considering expanding into much riskier private risky asset classes. It's something also that the Bank of Japan has done. They've right. even purchased equities. For, I mean, but this could be a treasury operation. This it is could, something yeah. that the Fed doesn't even have to do. Okay, this right. is fascinating stuff. Thank you, Emmanuel. I uh, hope you enjoy your time here in St. Louis. I'm looking forward to listening to the, your talk on the subject. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much.